Welcome, Wealth Advocates Nation. It's great to have everybody together again. We're talking about some incredible and very important topics today. I'm here with my business partner, John Mickelson. John, take a second, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I am a financial planner, a wealth manager. I've been doing this for 26 years now, and I am ruined for every other job because I really love what I do. Good. Love to have you with us. This is fantastic. So today we're going to talk a little bit about the SECURE Act, which came out in 2019, but it's really critical, really pertinent right now. So let's dive into it. Okay, John, let's talk about the SECURE Act of 2019 and really how it applies to 2020. So I think today our conversation is really going to just a look back at what it used to be and then a look forward of how it impacts us because there's been lots of changes in the SECURE Act. Before we jump into it too far, let's just do some uh, housekeeping issues because really um, your health and your wealth, they're very, very related right now. Health is a big concern for most of our people. Um, we're experiencing all kinds of changes in, in these unprecedented times. Got this great quote from Mahatma Gandhi. It's health that's the real wealth. We don't want people to uh, be unhealthy or disregard their health. Wealth is very important, but we want our people with us for a long, long time. Wealth Advocates is really principled on five different elements of wealth management. John, walk us through what those five elements are. Yeah, so I think it's important that people look at their overall planning in a very organized way. And part of our job is to make sure that uh, you're looking at all angles because most people don't look at these things as a group. And so as you look at you know, preservation planning, starting with making sure you have what you need uh, for the bumps in the road. So eliminate the big risks. That's something a lot of people overlook the, the small things, you know, healthcare catastrophe. I mean, that's at the forefront right now. Uh, making sure you have money that's readily available if the car breaks down or Christmas rolls around. Um, getting into retirement planning, making sure that you've got the goose that's gonna lay the golden eggs forever. Tax planning, are you doing all you can to minimize your income tax as well as your uh, portfolio tax? Uh, estate planning, uh, Money can be a blessing and it can be a curse. How do you make that a blessing to whoever gets it? Family, charity, wherever it ends up going when you're done. And lastly, investment planning, just making sure you have the right money for the right time frames. You don't invest long-term money aggressive or as, as uh, short-term money as aggressively as you would long-term money. So those are just kind of five areas that we want to make sure that you're really thinking through and addressing appropriately. So that's perfect. So as a comprehensive wealth management firm, Wealth Advocates focuses on these five principles. In the SECURE Act, the topic of today's conversation, we're really going to be diving into that retirement planning, the tax planning, the estate plan, critical elements in it. This, the estate uh, SECURE Act, excuse me, the SECURE Act, what a funny acronym, the Setting Every Community Up for Retirement Enhancement Act. So it's probably one of the largest uh, and most comprehensive reforms of, of retirement planning, maybe in 30 years. Like, well, we, in our slide, we say in 10 years, but it's really significant. We're going to talk about a whole bunch of different things, including age changes that are pertinent to our clients. We're going to talk about changes in inheriting assets. And um, all of these impact our clients in very different ways, whether you are in retirement and these are actually practically impacting you or you're planning for retirement, big changes, big conversations to be had. In all these things, there's two things I want you to consider. The first is, if you have a topic, if you have a question, if you have something that you think may apply to you, we're gonna have a link below to schedule something on our calendar and talk a little bit about this. The second is all year long, we're gonna to try to educate and update our clients on what's changing. So I hope you'll like and subscribe to this channel so that we can go through and talk about changes that are happening that are impacting you from preservation standpoint, 
from an investing standpoint, from an estate planning standpoint, a tax standpoint, and a risk management standpoint. So let's dive into the many, many changes inside the Setting Every Community Up for Retirement Enhancement Act. All right, John, talk to us about RMDs. What is an RMD, first of all? So whether you are aware of it or not, I know people that are at the age of 70 plus generally are very aware of what a required distribution is. And it's simply the idea that when you're, when you're saving for retirement, when you're accumulating, you're putting money in on a pre-tax basis to most traditional retirement plans. Roth IRAs are the exception. We can talk about that later. But the traditional retirement plan, you're putting money in and the money that would have gone to taxes stays in your account and works for you all over a lot of years. Now, at some point, the IRS is saying, hey, it's time to pay your tax. We want to, we've given you a benefit of letting you use the money. Now it's time to start paying the tax on the money. Now, in the previous rules, you had to start taking your required minimum distributions when you reached 70 and a half. That year, the year in which you turned 70 and a half, you had to start taking a required distribution. And it's a formula based on your age and your life expectancy. And then it's based on the value of your IRA account on January 1st of that year. So it changes every year. Now, the danger zone there is if you forget or you don't do it for whatever reason, the tax is 50%, half. Yeah. Not 10% or 15, it's half. You don't want to miss that. So generally we set it up to say, if you need funds during the year, the first thing we're gonna look at if you're over age 70 and a half is taking out that required distribution because we know we have to take it during the year and it will be taxable. So the second part of that is if you forget, we try to set up a catch-all where you say on December 1st or December 15th, whether you ask for it or not, it's going to go out because you do not want to get hit with a 50% tax. Now, the rule change came in the age in that if you were uh, not yet started on your required distributions, you had not re yet reached 70 and a half, you now can change and defer until age 72. So you got to wait a little longer before the IRS required you to start taking money out. So that summarizes the, the, the basic change in the age. And there's more changes we can talk about regarding um, how you can distribute it. So right during the COVID crisis, one of the bizarre ways we address this is we waived required minimum distributions in 2020. They're supposed to return in 2021. Is there a chance they won't return, John? I, you know, everything I'm reading right now and seeing, there is nothing stating they're going to do it again. And okay. part of it was because last time when they said, hey, we're going to let you waive your required distribution during COVID, during 2020, uh, it created a big mess because they told us halfway through the year, basically. And so some people had already taken money out mm -hmm. and then they were like, well, if I had the choice, I wouldn't have taken it out and paid the tax. So it created a kind of a bit of a mess for the IRS and for planning in general, for us in, as included. So I, I don't know, I haven't heard anything saying they're gonna consider doing that again. And my suspicion is they don't want to because it created such a, a havoc, such a mess for planning for last year. Right, right, big deal. Another big deal that came out of this is you mentioned the required minimum distributions Usually, it used to start at age 70 and a half. Now they start at age 72. Well, the age limit for traditional IRA contributions increased as well. So in an IRA, you used to not be able to contribute past 70 and a half, even if you had earned income. And that's a qualifier right there. You have to have earned income. There are a lot of people- You'll need to income, not passive income. But yeah, don't not passive, not from income. investments. You're going to work every day. You're earning that. And a lot of- a lot of our clients are saying, hey, retirement, I'm just going to kind of keep working through it because what else do I have to do? So they have earned income. And the new rules say that you can start and continue to contribute to your traditional IRA. And this year, that's going to be $7,000. Now, there's also a opportunity, if you're charitably inclined, 
to make distributions from your IRAs or your 401k direct, well, really from your IRA, directly into your charity of choice. Those are called qualified charitable distributions. It's a complicated element. It's one of those things that rather than giving you a, a tax advice on a YouTube channel, we'd like to visit with you personally. We'd like to collaborate with your accountant to make sure we're doing this right. That is one of the big benefits of working with Wealth Advocates is we coordinate all of your asset with your other professionals. This is one of those you really need to do. You do not want to A, do this by yourself or B, have your financial advisor do this by themselves. It needs to be a, a team of professionals working through this. So let's talk about qualified distributions to charities as a strategy for retirement, even though we told people we're not going to just give them free advice on this one because it is a team effort. John, anything you want to add on this that I haven't talked about so far? No, just simply that if you are charitably inclined in any way, there is often, very often, an advantage in making those contributions from your retirement accounts rather than doing it from cash. So that's, that's a, a big part of finding out how it affects your tax return. We don't always know what it'll work. And that's where coordinating between someone who's managing the money and someone who's reporting the tax is actually a pretty critical communication. Right. And a lot of people are just missing that because they don't have any kind of, uh, I don't know, team approach to it. Yep, yep, very true. So this new rule, it's not really part of the SECURE Act, but it is a new rule that it allows us to distribute up to $100,000 directly from your IRA to a qualified charity. Qualified charity meaning a 501c3 charity. So it does not go to the client's pocket. It goes directly from the custodian to the charity of their choice. It used to uh, have to stop at age 70 and a half. Now it can go beyond that. There's not really an age restriction restriction anymore. So what happens is let's functionally say that our required minimum distribution every year was a hundred thousand dollars. We could take it all the way up to that limit from the IRA directly to the charity. And that way we just don't have any taxable income that year. Again, as John said, suggested, we got to work with your accountant on this. We want to work with you on this. It's a, it's a whole team approach. Let's talk about 529 rule. Boy, those changed a lot in 2019. Anything you want to add on this one, John? Um, no, I, what, what I was going to mention was uh, on that required distribution to charity. Uh -huh. uh, I have a case right now where I have someone that wants to give, uh, you know, a not huge gifts, but gifts to all of her children and grandchildren. And there are over 25 of them. Oh. And she also wants to give to charity. And we've had a, 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 the ability to go through that analysis and say, okay, well, how much do we take for, you know, charitable purposes? And then how much more are we going to have to take beyond that? That helped her decide what kind of gift she wanted to give because she knew she had a certain amount that was going to come out and be taxable. And so that made sense to say, if I have to take it, that's a logical place to be uh, giving gifts. Exactly the kind of conversation we should be having with our clients. And if, if this impacts you, you know, click on the link below and let's schedule a time to talk through that and do the analysis. A lot of great things come out of, the, out of wealth management. It's mostly reliant on math. So really good point. On the 529, the, the SECURE Act also changed 529 rules where you can use up to $10,000 of 529 plans to pay off uh, loan repayments for qualified student loans. That's a very big change. So we can tap into those 529 plans for you, for your kids, for your grandkids to help on those loan repayments. Loan repayments, I'd actually wait on this one. Don't you think, John, maybe toward the third or fourth quarter because it's such a hot topic right now in Washington, D.C. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing to keep in mind is remember that on a 529 account, you as the, the, the contributor to the account maintain control. And so when a student goes out and, and, and I have clients that say, I want my, my kids to have the responsibility to go out and work through getting through school and including when, when necessary, get the student loans. And at the end, they like the idea of using the 529 accounts for loan forgiveness. 
And so it gives you power to kind of help them, you know, pay the price up front, but then help them out when they leave and not be burdened. Mm -hmm. That's that's a I think that's a great strategy for trying to say, hey, I don't want to kill their their uh, their drive and their momentum, but I also don't want to make it so easy that they don't feel like they contributed something. They have skin in the game. So I, I think in 529 accounts, the other thing to keep in mind is that you can move that 529 money from one child or one grandchild to another. It doesn't have to all be applied to one. And so if one gets scholarships or one gets other financial aid and they don't need quite as much and you have another child that needs that, you can shift that to where you see the need. That's great, that's great. How about this one? How about those heroes that participate in adoption? You did this, John, um, and I think that this is a little, this is delayed. This is not generous enough. Those people that participate in adoption, they change the trajectory of people's lives typically. So right now, the SECURE Act allows for a 10% penalty exemption. If we pull money out of an IRA, especially pre-59 and a half, there's a 10% penalty. We still pay the income taxes. But if it's used for adoption and births, then that 10% penalty is waived up to, I think it's $5,000 that you can pull out and put toward that. I've got a lot of clients participating in adoption right now. This could be a good source to help fund that. It's astronomically expensive. John, you wanna weigh in on this? Yeah, yeah, for, you know, especially for adoption. Adoption has gotten very, very complex because of the environment we, we're mm -hmm. living in. A lot of it is, you know, the fear of uh, trafficking. And so, especially if you do international adoptions, it can be extremely difficult and extreme, extremely challenging. So I, you know, in my personal situation, we adopted a little boy from, uh, from foster care. That was actually a very simple, clean system to be able to uh, adopt from. And that's very different than my clients that I've seen that adopt through like international sources where they had, uh, I mean, literally tens of thousands, even up to $100,000 that I, I know of where they had such extreme expenses. Now, again, remember that you're not avoiding the tax. You're just able to take out up to $10,000 and not hit a penalty. Normally there's a penalty and the tax. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be aware of your personal tax situation. It may be logical to take it out and pay the tax, and it may be better to use other sources. You've got to look at, you know, what is the impact of, of taking an additional $10,000 when you add it to your tax return? Okay. And so we're, we're focusing on adoption. That is, I, you know, people like you, John, that do that, I just think are heroes. That's a wonderful thing. It applies to birth as well. And so you're growing your family. You can pull $5,000 out of any of your retirement plans, a 401k or an IRA, and you can avoid that 10% penalty because all these things, any medical, uh, any component in the medical sphere right now is so, so expensive. So this is a real win for a lot of people. Let's talk about some proactive tax planning that can go inside the SECURE Act. So uh, there's a 10-year rule on inherited IRAs, inherited Roth IRAs, inherited qualified plans that they have to be distributed within 10 years of death. I just ran into this. I had a client, he, I mean, this is the most complicated uh, distribution from one generation to another I've ever participated in. And if I go into the details, it's too identifying. So I can't spend a lot of time on this, but I will say we've got four or five kids, uh, parents die within five months of each other. And it used to be, we could stretch those IRAs out over their lifetime. So they have a whole lifetime to pay their taxes. If you have a, a parent in their 70s, 80s, 90s, that typically means those that are inheriting the assets, assuming it's the next generation, are in their highest earning years or highest tax brackets. So the new Secure Act says you have 10 years to liquidate these accounts. And it's exactly like what you said, John. The IRS is saying, hey, you've had long enough. We want our money back. We want our, uh, we want our taxes. So over those 10 years, you've got to buy the IRS out of mom and dad's retirement plan. Each year, you have a required minimum distribution. It doesn't mean you have to wait until the years are over 
but it does mean, and so you can take it all out in lump, one lump sum and maybe you want to before the tax laws change, or you can spread it over those 10 years. If it's a large inheritance though, that's a, that's a big uh, tax impact to you. There are a bunch of exemptions to this. One is a surviving spouse. So, uh, you know, mom dies, dad's still around, dad inherits mom's IRA. That's easy. Um, if the kids, if the next generation that are inheriting it, if it's uh, children, if it's just children, not grandchildren, if they inherit it under the age of majority, which is 18, then they don't have to pay the taxes. If there's dis disability involved, if one's chronically ill, that's an exemption as well. And if the individual inheriting it is not more than 10 years younger than the person who died, the, the employee is what we're calling it on the slide. But whoever owned the IRA, if the person inheriting it is not more than 10 years younger than that person, then uh, there's an exemption there. John, did I miss anything on this? No, and, and you'll notice that these exemptions are usually, other than surviving spouse, they're kind of, they're, they're unusual. And so it's important to, to, to know that the vast majority of the, it, those inheriting IRA assets are going to be required to distribute them over a 10 year span. Yep. And that was, honestly, that was one I felt like they kind of, kind of passed this off when no one was looking because everyone was focused on COVID and all the other problems. But it had a huge impact. I mean, before you could spread it out over a lifetime. Now we're saying, hey, you've got 10 years. Now, remember, that doesn't mean you have to do it evenly. You, th that's, again, where the tax planning comes in. It may be that you have years where you have an unusually low year for income taxes and maybe one that's unusually high. You need to plan out what years do I take out more or less based on this time, time frame of 10 years. Again, so part of what Wealth Advocates does, we want to sit down with you, your CPA, and we want to do the math and we want to figure out the strategy. It's something we should uh, review every single year. John, we just invested in some very high-end software that allows us to do this analysis on what tax rates you're in right now, what changes you may be in in the future, and apply tax laws and tax brackets based on known elements of the tax law for the future years. So this is a big planning topic. If mom or dad die, you have 10 years to liquidate that account. If mom and dad are still alive, all the better. We ought to start talking about Roth IRA conversions because this could be a fairly significant tax burden on the next generation. One thing I'll add is this is one place where, whether it's a financial advisor of any kind, you know, a wealth manager, a CPA or attorney, if they can find one or two of these little spots, you're gonna save 10 times what you spend on their, their uh, resource, their, their cost. And so I think, I think it's important to recognize that, you know, a good advisor should return you two or three or four times as much or more of, than what you pay them. And that's yeah. hopefully true in almost all cases. I, I, that's what I think we try to hold ourselves to. That's a great point. That's a great point. Okay, so let's jump into spousal rollovers, the best way to do a spousal rollover. So uh, the inherited IRA is a concept that a lot of people have missed out on over the years. It wasn't good advice. It wasn't well documented for a lot of do-it-yourselfers. And IRA always, uh, if it was inherited by the next generation, it operates outside of a trust. And so the trust documents don't really spell that out. The owner of the IRA dictates who the IRA went to. So hypothetically, let's say I'm Larry King Live and I want to distribute my entire $2 million estate. John, is that really small for Larry King? Didn't you think his estate would be bigger than that? I bet it's a little larger. He's a spender. Anyway, uh, he, decides to inherit, he, he decides to name his entire estate on four of his seven children. And then the IRAs could be the other three children. So the trust says everything goes to these four kids the trust doesn't have anything to do with the IRAs. People would often just take those IRAs over. 
um, but the, the IRS requires you move them into a special IRA called a inherited IRA. Now, in this case, we're talking about a spousal rollover. So I thought I'd just give that some color that first, the next generation needs to have inherited IRAs. It doesn't just go into their IRAs. Let's back this up. So let's say that uh, dad's alive, mom passes away, dad inherits mom's IRA. Well, it can just go directly into his IRA. And then let's say dad passes, it now goes to the six kids, the so five kids, the four kids. Six kids in Utah is not abnormal. So let's a 600, it's a $600,000 IRA now. It goes to the six kids. Each of those kids need to have an inherited IRA set up to receive that. So John, one more time, what was the SECURE Act, the 10 year rule? Just recap that for us real quick. Yeah, so uh, you've got, once the, the money hits those inherited IRA accounts, each individual beneficiary can then decide how much money will come out each year, but it has to be completed in 10 years. That's right, that's right. So again, in my scenario, mom died first. Let's say that dad inherits her IRA. He now, over the rest of his lifetime, has to pay requirement of distributions on his and hers. It's a stretch IRA. He doesn't have to do this over 10 years. But when dad dies, the second to die, and it goes to the kids, they have to apply the 10-year rule on that. So there, there we go. First death, you know, however many years it is, I put eight years. We have to pay lifetime RMDs on that. Second death goes to the next generation, specifically to the kids. That's when the 10-year rule starts to apply. So one opportunity for tax planning is instead of the deceased spouse, we can do a smaller portion, maybe with one of the IRAs, the kids are the inheritor of it. So they do get, let's say mom had $100,000 in her IRA, dad has $500,000 in his IRA, Mom passes first. So the kids, all, I need to reduce the kids to five so I can do the math faster. All five of the kids on her $100,000 IRA, they inherit $20,000. Now over the next 10 years, I only have to pay taxes on the amount I pull out over that period of time and liquidate the $20,000 over that 10 year period. 10 years later, five years later, actually this next slide says it better. Five years later, Dad dies, now the $500,000, each of the kids inherit $100,000. They have to pay the taxes on that. You can split it so the kids get half of it right up front and the spouse gets half. And you can send it all, you can do all kinds of great things. And that's a strategy we gotta start talking through because typically what's happening my wife gets what I have, I get what she had. And whoever passes first, it just automatically happens. If I'm in my 70s or 80s and the Secure Act is looking me down the face, I want to make sure that I've got a better strategy. This is something we need to talk about with all of our clients. We need to sit down and say, okay, how are your beneficiaries set up? One of the things we focus on every year is these five principles of financial planning, risk management, estate planning, those, those occur in the second quarter. So right between March 31st and June 30th, we're gonna be going through your beneficiaries. We wanna to talk to you about this. And if, if you're kind of inclined about it right now, click on that link below. Let's talk about it sooner than later. Let's make sure that you've got your beneficiaries set up the way you want them set up. John, what did I miss? Nothing other than I'll reemphasize the idea that, you know, you hear people all the time, at least in my world, talk about how important it is to have your beneficiaries designated properly. And just as a general rule of thumb, you know, when people do estate planning and they set up a trust that exists beyond them, remember that most people are like, okay, I want my trust to do everything I've planned for. It. Well, the one place where you generally don't use your trust and you can set it up to do it, but most people don't, is for the retirement plans. You don't want your trust to be the recipient of your retirement plan, because that's a taxable event. You've then, you know, passed the opportunity to take advantage of this 10 year payout. So the general rule of thumb is your trust should control and own everything except retirement accounts. And so 
the, the point I was going to emphasize is it's amazing to me how simple that sounds. And as I go through <laughs> this next quarter, how many times it's just not set up properly. I mean, even after you think you've got it all right, it is so easy for it to, to be done incorrectly. Uh, changes in life. I mean, divorce or new children, or if you have uh, children that get married and you change the way you, you look at that. There are so many ways to mess up the beneficiary designations that I just say, just make sure that you check and double check that every single year. Why well, once a year we spend that second quarter going through beneficiaries with our clients. We want to make sure that that is airtight. We want to discuss how the rules have changed. And in this case, the rules have significantly changed. So another uh, issue inside the SECURE Act, that 10 year rule, well, we have to start talking about Roth conversions. Roth conversions could spread those distributions over many years at lower tax brackets. If, if you understand the 2018, 2017 Trump tax cuts, what ended up happening is there were more tax brackets, there were wider bands between those tax brackets, you had larger standard distribution, the net result on all that is you typically had lower taxes. Some of my people come to me and they're just astounded at how much they have to pay <clears throat> in taxes. And they think that these tax brackets didn't apply to them, these tax breaks, I should say. And we'll go through, John, we, I mentioned earlier, we invested in some software so we could be more proactive in the tax planning and help our CPA partners in their analysis because they have so much to do right now. Well, we invested in the software and it's amazing the delta between what people think they pay in taxes right now and what they really pay in taxes right now. I have some clients that should be in the 22, 24, 28, 32% tax brackets that are really in the 10, the 15, maybe the 18. And if those are your kind of numbers, it's probably time to start talking about tax bracket management. And not just your tax bracket management, start thinking about your family unit. And I love a good patriot, but paying too much taxes is a little too patriotic. So as we think about who's gonna inherit those funds, let's do broader tax planning than just right here, right now, this year. Let's play the long game. Let's look at your lifetime taxes. Let's look at your kids' taxes and inheritance. I, and, and the principle we're operating on here is just this. Do you think your taxes are gonna go up in the future or they're gonna go down in the future? And if you say down in the future, I'm not really suited to do therapy here. You can't borrow out $7 trillion for stimu stimulus spending and expect the taxes to go down. They have to go up. And so let's figure out what's the best this year tax strategy What's the best lifetime tax strategy? What's the best multi-generational tax strategy? And that's kind of what we're talking about in these slides. Should I leave my beneficiary a traditional IRA or a Roth IRA? What's conventional wisdom on this, John? Well, the idea is, is when should you pay the tax? So keep in mind that when you look at a, a traditional IRA or a 401k, 403b, whatever retirement plan you look at, the traditional side, and I alluded to this earlier, it's like saying, hey, I've earned a dollar. If I take it home, how much do I take home? Mm, 80 cents, 70 cents. I mean, that's where your, your taxes that are withheld uh, play into it. And so you're saying, okay, if I put the dollar in the retirement plan, the traditional side, I keep the whole dollar. Now, it's in the future, I will have to pay the tax, but I've had the use of the 20 or 30 cents that would have disappeared. Now, the question is, is if I do the opposite, that's called a Roth IRA. A Roth IRA says, hey, I'll go ahead and pay that tax now and I'll put it in the Roth, but whatever it creates going forward, when I take it out, there's no tax on that money. So if you lined up a, a traditional retirement account and a Roth account, and you said, hey, I'm gonna put my money in, pay the tax now or pay it later, I have the same investments, at the end, when you pay all the tax, you get exactly the same number. They are tax neutral. The question is, should you have paid the tax today or should you pay the tax tomorrow? Where is it gonna be lower? And, and a lot of that, we don't know. I mean, we don't know what they're going to do in terms of the taxes in the next year or two or three. However, if we do believe they're going up, 
and your tax bracket currently is low, obviously you should be paying the tax now. Now, if that's the case, if you're uh, contributing new money into a plan, you'd go into the Roth IRA. Now, to what Patrick was saying, you may have, uh, you know, in a situation where you can say, hey, I'm at a fairly low bracket. How many more dollars can I add in to my taxable income and stay at that low bracket? That's where we go and we analyze how much should go from your regular old retirement accounts and convert over to a Roth and pay the tax. So if you have room in a 10 or a 20 or even up, you know, I think the recommendations these days are generally, I hear most people saying anything below about 25%, pay the tax now. Now, I, I generally say, you know, 20% is, is borderline. Um, Patrick, I don't know if you feel differently about that, but if you, the idea is, is if you're in a lower bracket, like we're seeing on the chart there, than your children are, you should be paying the taxes, pay it and, and go up to the point where you can't, you say, Hey, going more than this makes no sense. It's like too many Oreos. The first few, they're awesome. And then you get to a certain point where they start to not be quite as good as they used to be. It's the same thing in taxes. You know, at some point you say, Hey, the pain is too much. Stop. But if you can pay it at a low enough bracket, think of your IRA as it's a house with a mortgage on it. Who's the mortgage? The government, the taxes. So the question is, can you pay that mortgage off at a 20% rate or lower instead of a 30 or 40% rate? That's the whole principle behind, you know, when, when do we make the conversion? And, and if your children are gonna be the ones that have the lower brackets, keep it in there as long as you can, let them pay the tax at some point in the future. Here's, a, here's probably the most uh, beneficial slide of the entire discussion today. So let me color it before we jump in here. Here's the back, background. So your marginal tax rate is something. So it could be as high as 35, 39 is what it's going to go up to. Uh, then your uh, marginal tax bracket for your beneficiaries. Those are the conversations we're looking for. So let's look at this. So today, this is supposed to sunset in 2026, but in 2021, if you're married filing jointly, you can see you've got a 10%, a 12%, a 22%, a 24%, a 32%, a 35%, and a 37%. That's that middle column I'm referring to. What happens in 2026 according to the information we know? Let, let me just throw a big asterisk in there and say things are changing fast right now. But according to the tax rules right now, that 22, that 24%, that 32%, those go away. So look at this, we go 10, we get rid of the 12, we jump directly to 15, we get rid of the 22, we jump to 25, then to 28, then to 33. What used to be the 24% tax bracket suddenly became the bottom of the 33% tax bracket. A third of everything you earned just went to the federal tax. And that didn't even take into consideration the state. There's a very fast point in here where you can pay more in taxes than you take than you keep in your pocket. And so thinking ahead is so critical right now. We have a good, let's call it five years, based on the existing knowledge as of this recording, to do some tax planning and get things better set up. So I think those are things we ought to talk about. We're going to do another recording on tax change proposals. And boy, that's eye-opening. So I'll, I'll add in with, with what Patrick said is... Yeah. is you're, most of you are probably either finishing your 2020 tax return or are getting close. That is a good one to start with and let us do the analysis on the tax return so we can see, are there opportunities? And it's not just the ones we're discussing today. There are a handful beyond that, that we can say, okay, we can see there are opportunities. And as we progress through the year, we can take advantage of those, if, but only if we know where they are. And again, I, I mentioned twice already how we want to help people in their tax planning. And we've invested pretty heavily in that. And we feel like, you know, we look at the tax the same way the accountant does, but on opposite ends of the coin. And yeah. so factors 
you take that column graph I just showed, the factors in a Roth conversion, we're going to be looking at the following tax rate differentials. What, what about the year in conversion versus the year of withdrawal? We're going to lo look at, do you have outside funds to pay that liability? Because you can't come to the table and say, I need to pull out $100,000 to convert $80,000. That doesn't work. It has to be funds in the table in your pocket right now. Um, we need to look at your, your existing annual living expenses. We want to consider RMD, time horizon and longevity, estate taxes, and as we keep harping, the 10-year rule. So this is what it can look like. Um, the red is uh, the, the future 2026 um, tax code and the black is the present day tax code. And so this is, there's that sweet spot. John, I actually feel like the 24% bracket is our sweet spot because it's going away. You can see the upper end of the 24% being the bottom end of the 33% in 2026 going forward. So I wanna maximize as much as I can going forward. Now, if you think you're gonna be in the 15% tax bracket, don't jump to the 24 just because I told you to. Well, let's do the math, let's figure this out. But there sure is some opportunity right now we can't miss out on. Yeah. Anything to add there, John? No, totally agree. Yeah, I think, that, I think that's exactly right. So here's some takeaways. Tax brackets, they could rise. I'm suggesting they absolutely will. That's not true. They could rise. There's a lot of suggestion, but they, it's just a could. And your account values, because I think we're going to have a ton of volatility in 2021. When your account value is down, what a wonderful time to do a conversion. You think about 2020, remember February to March, John, how miserable that was because people's accounts dropped 43% in 30 days. And while we're all, you know, wondering if the financial world has come to an end, some of the more proactive are saying, hey, I think this is going to be a short-term thing. I want to, A, convert this to a Roth IRA because my account is only half of what it was yesterday. And B, I want to buy more. So, I think, I don't think we're going to see a 50% drop this year, but boy, I do think we're going to see some volatility. We're already seeing it right now. Yeah. And, and we'll see that the that, that stimulus is con continuing. That will continue to fuel the markets for a time. But the one thing I will guarantee you is we have 200 years of history that prove that the market doesn't just go up. It will correct at some point. And to Patrick's point, like in March, you know, when the markets were down, it wasn't everything that was down. It was certain segments that got really beat up. And you can take advantage of saying, convert only those assets while they're all beat up, pay the tax while it's real, very, very low and leave the ones that are stable. And we'll do that some other time. And then when they rebound, like they did in April, May, June and July and through the end of the year, all of that has now converted. It's all been moved over into a tax-free structure. So all of that, that, that rebound and future growth is free of any income tax going forward. Wow, really well said, really well said. And I love this uh, imagery of the goldfish jumping from the qualified plan to the Roth IRA. We'll do some serious analysis before we say this is what you should do. But this is why you should do it. John just hit it. It's going to lower that overall taxable income long term. We'll start compounding the account tax free. We won't have required minimum distribution. So you're buying the government out of your retirement plan. And when you need that money, it's tax free, not just for you, but for your beneficiaries. So family tax bracket management is the new watchword inside of tax planning. We want to make sure that your taxes are as low as possible, but we also need to make sure that your kids' taxes are as low as possible. So let's look for opportunities to have that conversation this year. And um, also, again, that second quarter, we're going to hit hard again, as we do every year. Are your beneficiaries set up and are, are your contingent beneficiaries set up? Big, let me, big let me add a, a real quick side note on that one. You yeah, know, please. I guess on occasion, I'll just say that there are cases where charity doesn't start at home. So <laughs> when your kids are not the beneficiaries, 
or you do have charitable intent beyond what your children are going to get, you know, keep in mind that with the discussion we had prior about the required distributions, there are cases where those can be donated in a very significant way. That's where like in estate planning, life insurance and trusts for charities can be substantial gifts that can have incredible impact on something you feel passionate about. So just keep that as a, as a, as a side note but beneficiaries don't have to just be family. And all your kids are hating me by saying that, but the important thing is to think about, you know, what do you want that money to do yep. long term? Yep. And I've said this a couple of times here, but we take a team approach. We want to work with your CPA, your tax preparer. We want to work with your attorney. We want to work with all the professionals that manage your estate. Estate management is a lot more complicated than people give credit to. They're doing it themselves, and that's okay if you speak legalese and CPAEs and investment Ds, but most people don't. Most people do what they do. They want to have a personal life. They want to have relationships with their family, and this just adds a whole other layer to complexity. And this is where people put their foot in the financial bear trap, is they don't know how to do it right. We do it right because we're your financial project manager and we coordinate with all of your professionals. And right now, as it relates to the SECURE Act, we're going to coordinate with your CPA. So let's just hit some takeaways and wrap up here, John. So the SECURE Act's changed. It's changed in big ways, including the 10-year rule. We need to make sure that our clients understand that 10-year rule, that they understand the beneficiary designations, and I love what you said about charities. We should include charity planning and family tax planning. What else should we consider? Uh, you know, the only thing I would add to that is, and I alluded to this earlier, if you have an extremely good CPA, an extremely good attorney, and an extremely good wealth manager, there are two things. Either that you're either going to find a great opportunity that you would have overlooked and it only takes one or two or one or two big mistakes that you sidestepped. They should always be a huge value beyond what you pay. And so if we're not, then we're not useful to, to, to your world. But the, the vast majority of people we work with, that's what we're trying to accomplish. And so I, I just emphasize, especially on having a good attorney and a good accountant to work with someone like us is so critical. Perfect. Perfect. And, you know, that's really what we exist for is to help our clients understand those choices, make them simple. This video, like so many others that we do on our knowledge base YouTube channel, it's about educating our clients. We love an educated client because it leads for a deeper conversation about what are the opportunities out there. Your health is such a priority to us. You know, maybe we haven't been to your home. Maybe you haven't been to our office in a long time, and maybe you're feeling that we want to be very respectful for whatever restrictions you are in this very strange situation of uh, COVID and health that we're in right now. But that doesn't take away from our desire to help you deliver on your own personal goals. And that's what we exist for. So click on the link below, schedule a time for us to talk one-on-one -on -one about this. Also click like and subscribe on this channel so you can be regularly updated on all the new changes that are occurring this year. We're going to dedicate a lot of time to educating our clients on that. Anything else we should add here, John? No, just take advantage of what you can and, and let us know if we can be a resource. We don't fit everybody and that's okay. We do fit a certain group of clients that need simplicity in a very complex world, especially in a world where if you look at the last 10 years, you say, oh my gosh, all this technology has made it so much easier. Well, I have very few people that say my world, either financial or, or otherwise, is simpler than it was 10 years ago. If that's true of you, that's where we fit. Okay. All right, John, what else? Anything else we should cover today? Oh, just I wanted to just wrap up by saying we appreciate your time in thinking about these things. The fact that you're taking time to listen and try to learn is a sign that you do have you know, problems and concerns that matter. And they do have long-term impact, not just for you and your personal situation, but for a long time to come. And that's what we're trying to accomplish is just make, make sure that we're taking advantage of everything we can.
That's awesome. I'm Patrick Jenkins, John Nicholson. Thanks for joining us. We're Wealth Advocates. It's a pleasure to be able to work with you.